We are ready now to continue our study in the book of Hebrews. We are ready for chapters 8 and 9. 9, 8 and 9. I would admonish you as normal. Keep your Bible open and follow word for word. You'll get far more out of it. And again, I might say that the book of Hebrews takes very little explanation. And in this portion especially, there's not much more than just a good understanding manner of reading. And uh, then I think with that, you can understand it. Now, we are looking in the book of Hebrews, and here we find that the Jews who were believers were considering going back to Judaism because of the severe persecutions that they were receiving from their fellow Jews. So the writer of the book of Hebrews, out of the inspiration of the Spirit of God, is telling them that what they have in Christ and Christianity is far superior to what they had in Judaism, and therefore they ought to remain faithful. Now in making this known that Christ, the founder of Christianity, is superior to the founders of Judaism in 1, 1 through 10, 18, First of all, they said he's superior to the prophets. Then he's superior to the angels, and they explained that in a variety of ways. And then he is superior to the man Moses. Now, that meant a great deal as far as those uh, Jewish believers were concerned, those Hebrew believers. Uh, and this covers a good portion of the epistle. He is superior to the man Moses in 3 1 through 10 18. And he's superior in relation to the house that is built in relation to the rest that is offered, in relation to the priesthood that is established. And now in chapters 8, 9, and the first 18 verses of chapter 10, we find that he is superior in relation to the covenant that is mediated. And in this session, we're only going to look at chapters 8 and 9 in relation to the covenant that is mediated. Now notice with me, beginning in chapter 8, verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Now the things that we've been speaking about uh, concerning these things of, of uh, Christ being superior to the things in Moses, uh, he says this is the sum, or literally this is the summary. This is a summary of what we're speaking of. Now we see here in the first five verses that the old covenant was an earthly pattern of the heavenly. So that which was upon earth in that earthly tabernacle and the temple that was later built was only patterned after the one that is in the heavens. Now notice in the first five verses here. Now he said, this is a summary. We have such a high priest who is set, or who sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So we have a high priest now that sat down in the heavens on the right hand side of the majesty, that is of God a minister, that is the word for a public minister, of the sanctuary. That word sanctuary is a plural word which means holy places. Uh, so he is a public minister of the holy places and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Now the tabernacle that man pitched upon the earth he had to do it after the pattern which God gave them, and so he's talking about he's serving in a tabernacle in the heavens which the Lord pitched and not man being pitching upon the earth. For every high priest is ordained or appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So every priest on earth is, uh, is appointed for the purpose of offering gifts and sacrifices whereof it is of necessity, or literally for whereof it is necessary that this man, that is this man Christ, have somewhat also to offer. Now, he has something to offer, but back up in chapter 7 and verse 27, we are told what it was that he offered. Who needeth not daily as these high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. So Christ had an offering to make also, and as he gave himself, his own life was the offering for sin. Verse 4, For if indeed he were on earth, he should not be a priest. Now if he were here on earth, uh, he would not be a priest here, seeing that there are priests that are offering gifts according to the law. 
So we already have priests here according to the law that was given under, uh, under Moses who serve, that is, who religiously serve uh, unto the example or the uh, pattern of the similitude and the likeness and shadow of the heavenly things. Now, this is only a shadow, a pattern similar to the things that are in the heavens. Uh, even as Moses was admonished uh, of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, and now he quotes, See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. And that is in Exodus 25, 40. Now, so we see then that what Moses built, he had to do it after the pattern that was showed to him, which God showed to him from the heavens. And so Christ has entered into that true tabernacle. And the one on earth was only a pattern after that one in the heavens. So we see the old covenant was an earthly pattern of the heavenly and the replacing of the Old Covenant with the New Covenant was prophesied. It was told about. Now, in verses 6 through 13, we have this, but actually, beginning in verse 8 is a quotation from the Old Testament, and it's from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 35, or 34, 31 through 34. But now, notice hear the prophesying of this new covenant that was to be made beginning now in verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry or a more excellent public ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. So Christ is a mediator of a better covenant than was that with Moses in the law which was established or which hath been established or enacted upon better promises. It was established or enacted upon better promises than was the first one. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been being sought for the second. Now that's an obvious statement. If the first one was perfect, and it didn't have any faults in it, that there would be no need for the enactment of another one. For finding fault with them, he saith, and now he quotes from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. So here's what the Lord said about it. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make, or literally I will ratify, a new covenant with the house of Israel. I'm going to make a new covenant with them. And with the house of Judah, uh, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Now, it won't be according to that covenant that I made with their fathers of, in Israel. In the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Now, when he took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, out of that bondage, then as they were there in the wilderness, that's when the law was given and the covenant was made. So he said, it's not going to be like that because they continued not in my covenant. I gave it, but they didn't continue in it. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make or that I will covenant with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Now, he said, this is the covenant that I'll make with them later. Uh, I will put my law into their mind, that is, for understanding, and write them in or upon their hearts. I will be to them for a God, and they shall be to me for a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, that is, to recognize someone that you did not know otherwise, to know to, in order to recognize a stranger. For all shall know, thou shalt have an absolute acquaintance with me, from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses, 
and their sins and their iniquities or their lawlessnesses will I remember no more or no longer. And there he ends the quote. Now, uh, I want you to note a few things here in this. In verse 10, first of all, the law will no longer be external, but a law written in the heart of the individual. And then secondly, in verse 11, the people will be on intimate and affectionate terms with God so that the knowledge of God will be general, according to verse 11. And then in verse 12, the sin will be dealt with more radically and effectively, and those sins will not be remembered against them anymore. Now, uh, verse 13. <clears throat> in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now, that's an obvious statement. Uh, since he said, uh, make a new covenant, that means the first one was old. Now, that which decayeth, or actually that which becomes old, and aging, waxeth old, would be well rendered aging. So he says, now that uh, which is becoming old and aging is ready to vanish away, is near to disappearing. It is going aside. So we see the replacing of the old covenant with the new was prophesied, it was told about. And then in chapter 9, we see that the first covenant was only typical in the first 10 verses. And in the first five verses, we see the furniture of the tabernacle. And in the next five verses, 6 through 10, we see the service of the tabernacle. Now notice the furniture of the tabernacle in the first five verses of chapter 9. Then verily or truly the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly or an earthly sanctuary. So it was an earthly sanctuary that was there. For there was a tabernacle made or constructed, the first wherein was the candlesticks, that is, the lampstands. So here's some of the furniture and the table. Uh, so he's talking about in the place, the holy place, not the holy of holies, but as you enter into the holy place, into the tabernacle, uh, he says, first of all, there's the lampstands and the table and the showbread, or the setting forth of the loaves, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. So that was the holy place. And after the second veil, so as you went in, and then there's the veil then that was where one entered into the holiest of holies, and only the high priest could go there in just once a year. And he says, after the second veil, the tabernacle, that is the holiest, which is called the holiest of all, or literally the holy of holies, which is called the holy of holies, which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid, or having been and being overlaid round about with gold. It was totally uh, overlaid with gold completely. Wherein, that is, uh, in that Ark of the Covenant was the golden pot that had manna. So the manna that they ate was preserved through all of those years and those ages, and there was that gold pot full of manna, and there was Aaron's rod that budded. Always preserved, God keeping that alive through all of that time, Aaron's rod and it having budded. And there was the tables of the covenant, that is, the tables of the law, of the commandments that God had given. And over it, now up over this ark of the covenant, was the cherubims of glory. So you had the cherubims that covered up over the, that uh, Ark of the Covenant, shadowing uh, or uh, overshadowing the mercy seat. That is, the mercy seat was the place where propitiation was made once a year. As the high priest went in with blood, and as he sprinkled that on the mercy seat, if God accepted it, there was a propitiation or amends made for the sins of the people for one year. If he did not accept it, 
the priest fell dead and they had to put in grappling hooks and drag him out. And then, of course, you know, the next priest that went in, went in with trembling. But he says, there was the mercy seat of the place of propitiation, of or concerning which we cannot now speak. That is, it's not now the time to talk about these things any further. So we see here the uh, furniture in the tabernacle and then the service of the tabernacle in verses 6 through 10. Now, when these things were thus ordained, are these things having been and being ordained or uh, constructed, the priest went always uh, into the first tabernacle. Now, he was constantly going into that first part of the tabernacle, which was the holy place, accomplishing the services, the religious services of God. So that's where the sacrifices were regularly made. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, just once a year. Only the high priest could go in there, and he went in just one time per year, and he went in to sprinkle the blood to make atonement for the sins of the people for one year. So it had to be done over and over again annually. And there was regular sacrifices out in the holy place all the time by the priestly uh, uh, tribe. Now he says, now without blood, so the high priest went in once every year, not without blood. He always had to have blood to go in, which he offered for himself and for the errors or for the sins of the people. Now the sins of the ignorance of the people were offered at that time. The Holy Ghost, or literally the Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holiest, that is the way into the holy of holies, was not yet made manifest. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, uh, or which was a figure. Now that was a figure, that is it was a parable, it was a type for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the religious services perfect as pertaining to the conscience. You could not have a free conscience of forgiveness and cleansing because it had to be renewed and reminded annually, year by year, regularly, uh, which stood only uh, in or epi upon meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal or fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of refreshing or the a rectification, uh, the, uh, the time for the setting things right or straight. So we see then the service of the ta tabernacle was a regular thing going on constantly daily and then once a year into the holiest of holies to make amends for the people for the year. So the first covenant was only typical, but the new covenant was perfect. And we see this in verses 11 through 15. Now, notice here, in 11 through 15, the high priest is the person of Jesus Christ. But, but in contrast to what is said about this typical uh, tabernacle, but Christ being come a high priest, that is an areas participle, having become a high priest of good things to come, by means of or through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Now, he was through a greater and more perfect tabernacle that was not made with hands. It was the one that God pitched and not man. It wasn't one that was built by man as Moses and his people did. That is to say, not of this creation. The word building there is of the creation. So that tabernacle is not of this creation. It's in the heavenlies with Christ, neither by means of or through the blood of goats and calves, but by means of or through his own blood. So Christ sacrificed it with his own blood and sprinkled it there. Uh, with that he entered in once for all, that word once is literally once for all, into the holy of holies, 
into the very holiest place of the Holy of Holies, having obtained or found or won eternal redemption. The word for us is in italics, but it's there. It's for us, for everyone. So he obtained an eternal redemption. Now that redemption is one that never ends. It is eternal, uh, greater than everlasting. Now, uh, we have a redemption that is eternal, and it is for all humanity. So Jesus Christ is the high priest, and notice in verses 12 through 14, we have already seen there that the sacrifice is Christ's own blood. We've seen the beginning of that in verse 12, now verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of ashes of a heifer sprinkling the uh, unclean, or that is the defiled ones, sanctifieth unto the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who by means of or through uh, an eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve to uh, serve religiously the living God. Now he says, how much more could the blood of Christ do this work than of the blood of bulls and of goats? So there was the sacrifice of Christ's own blood, and the mediator of it all is Christ himself. Notice in verse 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of a new testament, or that word testament is literally covenant. He is the mediator of a new covenant. And as he said up, up above, if it's new, that made the first one old. So there was a new one that by means of death, or death having taken place, uh, unto, that word for is not gar, it is ice, unto the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant. So there was a full redemption of all of those who were under the first covenant through the work of Christ. They which are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So then, uh, we have an eternal inheritance through that work of Christ. Now notice also that the two covenants were both dedicated with blood. The old covenant, as well as the new covenant, they were both dedicated with blood. Now, the blood of the old covenant was shed by Moses, whereas the blood of the new covenant was shed by Christ, as we've seen. Now, Notice verse 16. For where a testament or a covenant is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator or the covenant victim. For a testament or a covenant is of force or is stable after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator or the covenant victim liveth. Now, let me illustrate this in this simple way. If one has a covenant, a will, as long as he's living, it's not in effect. But when he dies, then it becomes effective. Now, that's not a perfect illustration. But let me give you a, a, a interpretive understanding and reading of what this says. For where a covenant is, there must also of necessity be brought in the death of the covenant victim. For a covenant is stable over the dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the covenant victim liveth. So, here we're saying that there is blood that is shed for the covenant. And there has to be death for the covenant to be ratified in any way. Now, notice he continues now in verse 18. Uh, Whereupon neither the first covenant was dedicated or inaugurated without or apart from blood. That is, that first covenant, that one that was under Moses, it was not inaugurated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, now, Moses did this. He took the blood of calves and of goats with water 
and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. And that is in Exodus 24, 3 through 8. Now, here we see that this first covenant was dedicated with blood, and it was done by Moses. Verse 21. Moreover, or furthermore, he sprinkled likewise with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry of the public ministry. Now, he sprinkled all of those things with blood to inaugurate them. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now, this is a portion of Scripture that is so misused and abused so often, quoted totally out of its context. Without shedding of blood is no remission. Well, it's true. We do not have remission apart from the shedding of the blood of Christ. That's a fact. But that's not what he's talking about in this passage at all. It has nothing to do with that. What this is talking about is under the Old Testament law system that without, we can almost say that without shedding of blood was no remission. Now notice, and almost all things are according to the law. The word by is not dia, it is kata, according to. According to the law, purged or purified in the realm or sphere of blood. Now this word with is the word en. So, and we may almost say that all things are according to the law purified in blood. And we may almost say that without or apart from shedding of blood is no remission. Now there are many exceptions to that in the Old Testament. Blood was not always and the only thing necessary for remission in certain things and for purification. Now I want you to note that there are several, several exceptions to this in the Old Testament. In Exodus 19.10, I'm not going to turn to these to read them, but you can jot them down and look them up later if you would like. In Exodus 19.10, the purification was with water. Then in Exodus chapter 32, verses 30 through 35, it was prayer and punishment. Then in Leviticus 5, 11 through 13, Levitic, Leviticus 5, 11 through 13, there was the use of flour and fire. Then in Leviticus chapter 15, it was by water. Leviticus chapter 16, it was fire and water. Then in Leviticus 22, 1 through 7, it was with water. Then in Numbers chapter 16, 46 through 50, it was fire and incense. In Numbers 31, 19 through 24, it was fire and water. Now I want you to notice something else. Turn with me back to the book of Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the prayer of David after Nathan the prophet pointed out to him that he was the man that was guilty of taking another. Remember, he took Bathsheba in adultery and sent her husband out in the front of the battle to get him killed. And when his sin was pointed out to him, here is his response in his prayer in Psalm 51. I want you to notice closely how he is talking about a cleansing and sacrifices are not mentioned whatsoever. Now, beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. 
wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Now, here we find David finding great cleansing and forgiveness before God in his prayer, his supplication, and his repentance of the sin, acknowledging and willing to turn from it and confess what he had done that was wrong. So we find here in this verse, in chapter 9 and verse 22, it is often misused and misquoted. Although, as I said in the beginning, it is true, apart from the shedding of the blood of Christ, we have no remission today. Christ was separated from God on our behalf. Yes, that physical death and the shedding of blood was absolutely essential, but it was more than that. It was Christ being separated from God on our behalf. He being eternal, infinite God, separated one time, was the same as us being separated from God eternally. Now, He paid that penalty for us and was separated on our behalf and paid the penalty for our sin. But here he's talking about under the law how all things were inaugurated with blood. And without the shedding of blood, almost nothing was was purified apart from it. Now, in verses 23 through 28, we find the blood of the new covenant was shed by Christ. Now, notice in verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns or that the, the similitude, the, the uh, copies of things in the heavens should be purified with these. With these what? The things mentioned up in verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Now, he says it was appropriate that this thing that was a pattern upon the earth after the pattern after the heavenly be purified with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So then he says the heavenly things, they were to be purified and set apart with better sacrifices than that of the blood of bulls and goats. Now, verse 24, for Christ uh, is not, or literally Christ did not enter into the holy of holies, the holy places, that is the holy of holies, made with hands. He didn't enter into the one that had been made with hands, built by man, by Moses or by Solomon or any of the others that built the temple, which is the figure. Uh, That is a corresponding figure of the true. So this thing on the earth was only a corresponding figure of the true one, which is in the heavens. But in the heaven itself, this is where Christ entered, but in the heaven itself, now to appear or uh, to be manifested in the presence of God or before the face of God for us. He did it on our behalf for us. He did it. Nor yet did he enter 
that he should offer himself often. He didn't have to offer himself many times as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. Now see, in this earthly tabernacle, the high priest had to go in every year with blood. But Christ did not have to do it more than once. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. If that's the way he had to do it, he had to suffer it over and over and over again. But now, once or once for all, in the end of the world. Now notice that phrase, in the end of the world. Upon the completion of the age. But now, once for all, upon the completion of the age, hath he appeared or hath he been manifested. For what purpose? To put away sin. How? By means of or through the sacrifice of himself. Christ was the sacrifice himself, and he did it at the completion of the age that there might be the full com putting away of sins by the sacrificing of himself upon the cross. And then he goes on to say, and as it is appointed to men once to die. Now, all people, all men are going to die that one time. We're all going to die physically. Yes, even if a person is living at the time of the rapture, he will experience physical death. The word death simply means separation. Thanatos is the word, and it means separation. Physical death is the separation of the real person, the soul and the spirit, from the physical body. That's physical separation. Now, spiritual death is when God, who is a spirit separated from mankind back in the Garden of Eden, because we sinned, and then all people are born in that state of spiritual separation from God. God's Spirit separated from us. At the new birth of the regeneration, our salvation, the Spirit of God is reborn into us. And then the eternal second death is for the unsaved who are separated from God the second time. It's the second separation from God in the eternal lake of fire. But now he says he's talking about death. As Christ died one time, so once for all, men are going to die one time, but after this, the judgment. You see, if one is living as a believer at the time of the rapture, he's not going to go up in that human body. As we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, it shall be changed. So there will be that, what we would call instant death, that separation from this physical human body, and enter into that perfect glorified body, which is death. So it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. We go before God's judgment. So, Christ was once for all offered to bear the sins of the many, that is, the many of humanity, not just many out of the total, but the many which is the total. So Christ was once for all offered to bear the sins of the many, and unto them that look for him. Now notice that word look for, that's one word, and it literally is receiving. It's a, uh, them that look for him, a uh, present participle, those who are receiving him, shall he appear, shall he be manifested the second time. Now, Christ appeared to put away sin. Now those who have received him for salvation, He's going to appear a second time without or apart from sin unto a salvation that is a salvation of the body. And that is what is called the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body when we become the full sons of God rather than just the children of God. So what we're seeing here is that Christ is superior to the man Moses. He's superior in relation to the house that is built He's superior in relation to the rest that is offered, in relation to the priesthood that is established, and in relation to the covenant that has been mediated, and it was mediated by Christ. Now, this portion will be completed in our next session in the first 18 verses of chapter 10, and then we go on, then because of these things being superior, we have a greater encouragement to go on to faithfulness. Now, since Christ 
the founder of Christianity, it's a period of the founders of Judaism, then the believers have a greater encouragement to go on to faithfulness in this Christian life, and so do we today. It's not just for these Hebrew believers back in that day, but it's for us as well. Since we have this salvation in Christ, we ought to be faithful, we ought to endure, and we ought to continue faithfully in our servitude in religious service unto him. The decision is ours. It's our responsibility. Will we take it?